side of the battery on your camper van and then you've got the, the negative terminal which if you look in the back of your camper van you'll see the negative terminal just goes straight to the body of the vehicle okay and then the positive one goes off via a, via the, the complicated tube map as Alex called it to the component now the earth if you notice so I'm going to demo, for, the, for the purpose of demonstrating what my probe is so you get a, a green light that means that the battery is the, the, the detecting of earth on the battery. Likewise, if I put the probe anywhere on the camper van, which is what we're going to call this shelf, again, you should get an earth signal. Okay? So anywhere on the vehicle where the anywhere on the vehicle where the component needs to pick up an earth, you can test that you've got an earth by putting your probe onto it, you, you get a green light. A positive one will be detected by a red light. So the positive side of the battery has got a red light. Okay, so you know you've got power. Also, so, so this is a wire that comes off the positive side. Again, if you put it on, we know we've got power because we've got a red light. These probes are fantastic. They are, they will be your friend. Once you learn how to use them, learn how to read the wiring diagram, you're going to be able you hold, you hold that on the side of the bulb. Now we've got, uh, we've got power, okay? We put that on the bulb, on the tip of the bulb, and it works. So we've, we've now checked our components. So that's, that's your earth, we know we've got earth is power. So that's how you would check a bulb. Okay. Okay. So as soon as we attach the earth wire, this whole unit will be earthed. I'll show you right now. So we put that on, and straight away, see the whole unit is earthed. So that might be the first thing you're going to actually check when you're actually checking for a problem. Check if there's actually an earth going to the unit. So we put that in. That's earth. We force a power to the actual power terminal. We know the bulb's good, incidentally, because the earth signal is coming all the way through the filament of the bulb from the unit to the positive terminal. So we know we've got a, a complete circuit there. So as soon as we put, put that on, we know your bulb works big square thing with the round portholes on the side. Can everyone see it? Okay, from the battery, um, the first, first complication, the first thing it's going to show you is you've got some big black wires coming off. Now I've just told you that 99.9% .9 of the time black wires are ignition live, but this is the exception to the rule, this is that point naught 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 one percent of the time when the actual black wires are actually, they actually represent the big fat black battery terminals wires. On the, on the, the right hand side as you look at the battery you've got, you've got the earth and it goes straight to the body and then you've got your, the big black one here which generally goes to, goes to number 30 on the, the starter motor. Yeah. I'll come to it later on, but on the coil at 15. Okay, okay. They're, they're quite important to know. Ever said that you lost everything mm -hmm. on your vehicle. Mm -hmm. If you're going to lose everything, it's probably this primary number one archery wire, should we call it, that was probably failed on your van. And you push, you push the, the, this in, it'll actually find its own way home. And then. Squish them. Yeah, just, just squish them. Don't take my finger out. Whatever you do. Push it all the way, and all the way until it releases. Keep going. Keep going. That's it. I think that will. So is that a tent? A little, little bit more. And it will squish. Just yeah, squish. It. Squish. Two hands, and it just squishes up. We've done a really nice, oh, strong terminal there. 
goes in directly from the end, about sort of 10 mil in, quarter of an inch or whatever, all the way, nice and hard. That's it, you've done it. Give that a little bit of a twist. Giving it a bit of a twist just stops all the wires from kind of stranding out and making. This is a this is a ter spade terminal, spade yeah, terminal. Where does the terminal go? And it goes on to, it'll go on to the fuse box, it'll go on to the, the back of your light unit, it'll go on to your indicator relay, pretty much wherever there's a wire, there'll be one of them at the end of it. And because they're all sort of 40 years old or whatever, a lot of the time they're really loose and horrible. So we poke that into, let's poke that. Okay, so that goes in. Okay, right, now both hands. Is that alright? Yeah, go on. No, you're alright. That's it. Yep, you've done it. Let's do that. Okay, so we've got a really nice, strong thing. If you want to, well done, thank you very much, Brian. Um, if you want to actually check that everything's doing as it should and it's conducting electricity in the right places, just put your probe on to it. Obviously, make sure if it's an ignition light. 1950s, 60s, when, when water grade oil was known for some air, they weren't very good. Um, you just sort of journeys were different as well then, you know, you could just get on the motorway and, and this um, corresponds with a little um, screw head that pokes through on the end of this, this is the, the screw itself going through holding the dynamo together. So you can get a screwdriver, not a ratchet one, and you can just pop that in there, lock that up. Yeah, because basically you've got to stop the pulley spinning so that you can undo the nut, because the nut's quite tight. Now that's held, I mean just just simply undo that. This is in two halves. These shims is also how you adjust the tension of the fan belt. If the fan belt um, obviously you can see it's Kind of V. When the two are together, here. they sort of, yeah, they sort of meet like that. So if the fan belt's running higher up in the V, obviously it's tighter than when it's sort of running at the bottom of the V, and you space the pulley apart with the shims to um, to set your tension. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let's, let's, oh, if we put this back on without the fan belt in, if you put the um, up there. Well, you imagine you're the fan belt sitting in that V. If this, if this, um, if this comes further apart, that's going to make the belt looser because the belt's going to go down inside the groove because it's wider. And to, and to get set the tension, you just have to keep basically taking the shims in and out until you get it where you want it. It's a, the first time you do it, it's a bit of a rigmarole because you, you know, sort of do it. That's too tight. Put some shims in. That's too loose. You know, and it's just finding that. Yeah. 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 Oh, God, that's really thin. Oh, it's loaded yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, you should have around about 10 in the set. Um, but they'll be there. They should be there. Yeah. If they're not... Do they, do they wear out? No, not, not no, really, no. If you, um, if you get hold of the belt when it's in the car, and kind of, if you stretch it and you see this is... I mean, it's not, this one isn't great, obviously, which is why it isn't in active service. It's all cracked in there. If you get hold of yours when it's under tension and kind of open it up like that and if you see if it's all cracked and gnarly inside there it's time for a new one. Yeah, horrible hideous noises. And, if it, and what can I say that the pulley can break, they can shatter. And that can cause you know and that can be quite nasty because obviously the pulley is not far away from the carburetor on this engine, it's full of fuel, which isn't that yeah, we can, um, we'll have a little look okay. at that at lunch or something. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So you, you can get a decent system for a couple hundred quid. Mm -hmm. I know, it's better if you've got sort of a £20,000 camper. Mm -hmm. You know, for sake of, you know, 1% of the value of the vehicle. You've got this configuration of the engine, and all this tinware here, everything that goes around the back, everything is there for a reason. To keep the exhaust heat away from the fan, so the fan can draw cold air in the air intake. When these engines were first designed. So, we now recommend um, for a good all round engine oil that can sort of, you know, you can use in the summer and the winter, um, which is 20 to 50 uh, multi grade oil. Um, the company called Millers, who we will be a stock of, um, makes a very good, high quality 20 to 50 oil. But you must, must remove this plate and clean it.
and that's a good indication if there's grey sludge on there that your engine's a little bit unhappy. Um, it doesn't have a proper, this type of engine doesn't have a proper spin-on um, modern type oil filter. So what they gave them was a reusable filter. Basically this goes into that um, into the hole in the bottom of the crankcase and is held on by those, those six nuts. It's essentially a T strain. You know, it's got it's got a wide gauze in it that will floating around in the oil after um, after you've been riding it for any length of time. Because you know when you put the engine oil in it's a nice sort of clear golden yellow colour. <coughs> when you come to take it out black. Almost. Um, the way to remove that unfortunately is I would say only with a proper yeah, oil filter right. tool. There are several different styles. One and they open and close the valves in the cylinder head to let the fuel air mixture from your carburetor in and then also lets the burnt mixture out. Yeah. As you can imagine, the push rod gets pushed up and then back down again by the cam load. Because obviously if there's a lifter here, we we'll unfortunately have to put five on so. Basically this push rod is going backwards and forwards following this cam trap. And it's pushing on the rocker and basically making it do that. You know, it's rocking backwards and forwards. And to adjust the valves, you have to make sure that both of these valves are closed at the same time. Now the only point in the engine cycle when both valves are closed at the same time is when the, um, the spark is going to ignite uh, to the spark plug. As I said earlier, you adjust the valves when the um, spark is going to be sent to the plug lead. Now, over here, the distributor distributes the spark um, to each of the plug leads through the distributor cap. If you look inside, you see there's four terminals here. And each one corresponds to each plug lead, which obviously corresponds to each cylinder. Now, one cylinder. So what I do is I turn the engine over, and on your on your front on your pulley on the Type 4 engine and on the um, Type 1 engine, there's a timing mark, which normally is highlighted um, in some way um, with uh, either a white mark or it's normally there's at least a V cut into the pulley so that you can see where it is, and you need to turn the engine over till you get that um, mark in line with the crankcase um, crack on this. Um, 0.15 of a millimetre, which is um, all you need is a crack size spanner, normally a 13 millimetre spanner. And on the on the on the rocker you've got um, you've got basically three parts. You've got the rocker itself, you've got the um, the lock nut, and you've got the adjusting screw. So we'll see that. Um, um, to adjust the uh, valve clearance, you undo the lock nut, just need to back it off a little bit, and then out of the way. I'll just demonstrate. If we wind the screw out, essentially I'm giving it lots of valve clearance now, way too much. You'll see it's... No. If you had that on your engine it would barely run and it would sound awful. Whereas if we wind it all the way in, if you look very closely you can see I'm actually, you see the valves actually starting to open and close, you see the valves moving because there's See that, that, that sp the spring and the cap and everything are all moving backwards and forwards because that's over tightened. And if if you ran the engine like that, that's when the the um, the valve overheats and so it causes you all sorts of trouble. And then what you're setting is that clearance between the two. And so it's, it's quite a tight clearance, but it's um, it's essential to the the longevity of the engine. And all you do is you wind the screw in until you get. Um, you can feel sort of the tension in the screw, but it's not so tight as you can't move the, the, um, the feeler gauge. It's sort of like, you should be able to leave the feeler gauge hanging. It should be able to stay where it is, but you should be able to just sort of gently pull it out, which is with two fingers. You, shouldn't, you know, you don't need to sort of put both feet on the engine and drag it. Like. You might have to sort of put a little bit of sort of opposite direction pressure on the screw, but not actually turn it, so that you can turn the spanner, because obviously as you turn the nut, it's going to try and turn the, the screw at the same time. Just tighten it up. And double check again, it's got the same, still got the same clearance. Bingo.